Okay, at this time I'd like to welcome Congressman Lee Zeldin.
multiple departments within it. So part of their consideration is fish and wildlife, which is always a challenge when we're dealing with our local issues, um, with their constituencies, with the Endangered Species Act, and whatnot. Some of their concerns would be different than, than your concerns. Um, so those are uh, a few local issues that come to mind. I have a couple of others uh, that, that pop out at me while while we're continuing. And if any of you have any local questions on, on any of that stuff, please let me know. Uh, as I mentioned, we go back down to Washington, D.C. On, uh, on Monday. And there are times where uh, we are leaving Congress and you, you scratch your head and say, why are you leaving? You need to stay there to get such and such done and don't leave until that gets done. Um, for example, in the middle of a government shutdown, uh, everyone should stay in Washington DC, lock everybody into a room. Um, it, 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 when you get into the week three, week four, week five, no pay, no phones. Uh, don't leave until there's white smoke. Uh, that was my thought process as, as I was witnessing the shutdown that took place at the beginning of this year. As you started to get towards the middle to end of January, people were going home on the weekends. But I would say this, when you got to the end of July, of this year, just before this August recess started, uh, I thought it was actually a very good thing that you saw members leaving Washington, D.C. to hopefully go back to their congressional districts. Uh, there are different things that keep you grounded. Uh, for me, uh, I, I have one extra thing uh, in my life that helps keep me grounded, but you have your district, you have your family, uh, and for me, I continue to serve in, in the reserves. All three things keep me grounded. I'm not ranked by a lot of people in my reserve unit. I'm not ranked in my house, right down the road. Um, my daughter just started a trade here at, uh, at PACA. They're turning 13 at the end of this month. Um, I know they've been crawling around this room. I guess it wasn't at, back in the day. I was uh, practically crawling around this room. Um, as you know, we, we were coming up on the uh, 200. That was one other thing I wanted to mention. It actually hit me as I'm mentioning it. So William Floyd, the first congressman, the first congressional district. Um, so the William Floyd estate, uh, currently has two full-time staffers. Uh, you have a new uh, FINS superintendent that came into the position in October of 2018. Uh, he's submitting a request for, or has submitted a request for eight new staff positions at the Wind Floyd State. Additionally, you need to have um, some infrastructure work on several projects. Uh, all of the projects are in the six figures. They aren't uh, seven figure plus requests, but it does add up to be uh, into the seven figures when you look at all of the requests. Uh, the timeline as far as a goal to be able to get everything done is for the 250th anniversary, which is coming up in six and a half years plus uh, as we start 2026, and I'm sure there'll be a lot going on. Uh, that year at the Wayne Florida State. So that's the goal as far as infrastructure is to get all the stuff done over the course of the next several years. Um, everything from deer fence, and you all know why, uh, when you go visit the estate and why that's necessary, to the actual infrastructure to, um, to the maintenance um, and having an equipment storage facility, which actually is probably the largest item, uh, largest cost item of everything that they had requested. So that's a little bit of Wayne Florida State. <coughs> anyway, going back to Congress. So when we, uh, when we leave, um, it was actually a very good thing that we were seeing members get out of there because if you spend too much time in Washington, D.C., there are people who will start to think that Washington, D.C. is reality and everything else isn't. When in fact, everything else is reality and Washington is the opposite of it. Um, and it's good to go back to be with your family, to be with constituents um, or I have drill on Saturday. Um, so all that stuff helps keep you grounded. It was very toxic at the end of July. I mean, it's been toxic for years, and in a way, it's, you know, for years before that. Um, but it's been really bad. And uh, you know, one of the dynamics, we have four different co conferences, the House Republicans, the House Democrats, the Senate Republicans, the Senate Democrats. And a, a, a unique thing that I haven't experienced yet is that, uh, so within, the, and there have been times where, where different conferences have had uglier moments than others um, as far as infighting and whatnot. But, uh, but right now, uh, you have a few freshman members uh, of, of the House who are getting a lot of the oxygen, a lot of the attention in Washington, but you also have dozens of others who are freshmen in the House 
And when you run for Congress, you want to go to Washington, you want to get good things done, you want to be able to go back to your district and tell people about things that actually got over the finish line, and they aren't able to get um, what they thought they would be accomplishing in their first year done. Those, uh, those freshman members are primary their colleagues, including members of leadership and committee chairs. It's creating a very toxic environment. So in, in the city, I have a freshman colleague that you might have heard of, um, named Ocasio Cortez, who um, you know, we've interacted a bit. One of the interesting dynamics of what was going on there is that, that her group is primary. Nadler, Angle, Maloney, Meeks, uh, Clark, they're trying to find someone against uh, Hakeem Jeffries. So that dynamic, and by the way, they're, they're all in the, same, in the same party. I really do hope that everyone going back to their districts, spending some time away from Washington, can result in us coming back and finding ways to get good things done. There are times where good things don't get done because of partisanship, and that's bad. There are times where, where uh, bad things don't get done because of partisanship, and that's good. And then there are a whole lot of other times where good things get done and you don't hear anything about it. Uh, it doesn't sell for the media to tell you about good things that are going on uh, in your government. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't sell. If you put on TV, they're trying to get your blood pressure going. Uh, that, that helps with ratings. And on the websites now, it's become entertainment. They get paid based on hits in place. Uh, hitting the website, click the link, or they won't get paid. Uh, I really do hope that once we go back uh, to Washington next week, over the course of the coming months, before uh, the presidential race heats up, before congressional primaries uh, heat up as we get to 2020, that we can get some good things uh, done over the course of uh, the next few months. Uh, there have been several dozen bills that have actually got passed and over the finish line so far this year in 2018, but you don't really hear about it. There were over 400 bills that got passed and signed into law. My first, uh, my, I'm sorry, my second term, this is my third term, my fifth year. Uh, there were over 400 bills that got done in 17 and 18. And actually, that was a Republican Congress with a Republican president. But in my first term, in 2015 and 2016, with a Republican Congress and a Democratic president, a lot of people think that nothing ended up getting done. Where even then, Republican Congress, Democratic president, and in the Senate were 60 votes, there were over 350 bills that were passed and signed as well. They included some smaller things that might have been more local, but it also included some big things too uh, that help as the ways to combat and the opioid abuse epidemic. Now I've got on a fiber highway bill, which by the way, the language that we got added to that fiber highway bill, which changed the funding formula for state and local bridges, that's where the $57 million came from for Smith Point. It's also where the $26 million came from for Hospital Road Bridge, which is also completing their design uh, as well. Uh, there was a big Medicare bill that got passed, an education bill, so big things got done as well. Uh, hopefully when we get back, uh, we'll be able to get a few months of finding, um, finding progress, whatever it's possible. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to, uh, to represent the community that you're up in. Uh, it's kind of cool to uh, see my daughters going to the same little chairs that, uh, that I did. Sort of have, uh, yeah, those good teachers and whatnot. So, um, you, all know where, uh, you all know where I live and went to class with, uh, with, with your kids um, or you're going to school. Are you in ninth grade? Are you a PACA? I oh, thought you were just out of high school. Were you at PACA? Yeah, stay away from my daughter. <laughs> Yeah, the, the first time that I went for parent-teacher conferences at Hobart, and sitting in the same little chairs, they're a lot smaller than I remember when I went to school. But it is a privilege to be able to represent uh, the first congressional district. It's great to represent uh, this local community, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thanks again for having me, and thanks for being patient as far as uh, setting uh, time for the, uh, the meeting when I was around. And, uh, Okay, uh, Kevin. It's almost certainly not going to happen. One thing I've learned, I learned this about Washington before I was in Washington, is 
be careful when you talk about certainties because I uh, saw so the same thing happen up in Albany. I would be absolutely shocked if it wasn't renewed. I, I would say it's almost 100%. Oh, yeah, I would say, and by the way, you're talking about in, in the hurricane season? I mean, the chances of it expiring on September 30th uh, with nothing getting passed to extend it is, is practically zero. I wish I could say zero, but never really say that until something actually gets gets done. The key with uh, with, with uh, the, the whole flood insurance program, NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, is that it really needs to get put on a path towards fiscal solvency. Uh, it is, it, it does not sustain itself. And uh, we were almost there in September of 2017, and they ended up punting for 90 days the uh, flood insurance extension. So instead of doing it in September, we had many more days to reach an agreement. And the problem was in the middle of those 90 days, uh, you bailed, there was a bailout of two thirds of the $24 million that the NFIP was in debt, which got rid of that desire to, or that need to urgently put it on the path to fiscal solvency because it was just bailed out. Um, but as far as improving mapping, uh, giving uh, tax credits for mitigation. Uh, if you are investing in mitigation in your own property, you should see the reduction in your own premium. Uh, there are a lot of good ideas to improve the, uh, the program. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I, 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 there are a lot of battles that, that go on um, between Republicans and Democrats, but flood insurance has been won historically. By the way, two, flood, two big authorizations ago, it was called Bigger Waters. Uh, and when you fast forward a few years, it's called uh, Grim Waters. Now, so Maxie Waters is the chair of the committee, uh, working with a Republican. They you know, and, and it was bipartisan. So on that, that uh, on that committee, uh, Pete King is on it, as well as uh, Velasquez and Maloney and Eats. Uh, so you have. And by the way, I call them. Um, you know, little Maloney is on a different island. I like to call. Our friends from Brooklyn and Queens, Long Islanders, uh, and ask them what bridge they take to get to Nassau. Uh, and they tell me that they're not Long Islanders, but it's, they have similar concerns. Uh, and, you know, there, where I might be talking about investing in your house mitigation, there they might be talking about raising, uh, raising equipment to a, raising your burner up to a higher floor of your apartment or your co-op. So to get credit for the mitigation. So you know there, there are natural alliances there, but um, I think it's gonna get extended. The one thing that I doubt is that this month you're gonna see a big reauthorization that actually helps modernize the program. That's something that you know hopefully will get done you know, at some point in this Congress, but I'm not sure. That's what really needs to get done though, is putting a program on the fifth path to fiscal solvency and fixing some of these other issues. Next. So the question is with regards to the state of Puerto Rico, what state are they right now as it relates to the United States and what is the status of uh, Puerto Rico actually becoming a state? So Puerto Rico is a protected territory. These are United States citizens uh, who, uh, who live there. We have a relationship with the people of Puerto Rico, a responsibility as it relates to Puerto Rico, even though they are not a state, when a, a hurricane hits Puerto Rico, we have a responsibility as Americans to work with them. Now, even just like 
any of our 50 states get impacted by natural disaster, uh, there are conversations of how much money is needed, how is it going to be spent, making sure the money is spent efficiently. That's a conversation of whether you're talking about New York, Texas, Florida, or Puerto Rico getting hit that, that needs to be had. Um, so that we have that relationship right now. The, but as far as them becoming a, a state, I haven't heard uh, any update on it, uh, progressing towards them becoming a state. Uh, there have been times where Puerto Rico has decided that they would want that, but other times the people of Puerto Rico decided they didn't want it. Uh, I will tell you that they have uh, some serious issues with regards to their own financial situation. Really, really bad situation. Um, it, right now that you know, there have been control boards enacted, there are appointments, they, these people are in Washington, D.C., they meet with members of Congress, and candidly, Puerto Rico is, is dealing with some very serious financial issues. So if they were going to become a state, part of that conversation that you will have to have, whether it's in Congress or amongst the American people, is what to do about all of you know, their debt. Are they going to continue to own it themselves, or is the federal government going to assist with it more? Because the federal government has been assisting with it. There was uh, a bailout package that was passed out for the past for Puerto Rico and signed into law not that long ago. Um, and will they need something like that done again? Uh, you know, the, the key is that if when you're providing that type of money that they're enacting structural reforms so that they're actually fixing it, they're not going to continue to have to uh, put that to the people. But I think that um, that's, one of, that's one of the issues that I'm hearing in Washington, but not any type of an update as far as them becoming a state. Okay. Uh, how about a gentleman back there in the pool? Hey, I, I thank, thank you very much. Um, my name is Steve Lucas. I live in Shirley. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the tax bill as a whole. You voted for House Resolution 71 to send the tax bill, tax cut bill, to the Senate. Vote. I talked to Mr. Doyle on the phone because I was concerned because it had the salt language in House Resolution 71 that you voted for. I was concerned that the Senate voted yes on that package, we would get hurt with the salt situation. And Bill promised me, swore to me, don't worry, the Senate's going to send it back to us without it. Well, guess what? And I thought, you know, I told him that's a dangerous game to play because gambling with, with, with my money, and I'm, I'm concerned. A, you were for it or you were against it, because the salt language. I tried to prepare last year, my accountant said pay $75 a week for a paycheck of it, 75 extra to the federal, so you can hold it. And I'll be honest, $75 is a lot of money to me. So me and my wife discussed it, and she took $50 out of my, out of my check hoping that we wouldn't owe at the end of the year. Well, guess what? I owe it for the first time in my life. I live in Shirley, you should live in Shirley. Uh, you know, we work, me and my wife work very hard, we both work full time. And I want to know, A, if you have any regrets on voting for the House Resolution 71, which has a sole language in it. So everyone has consulted state and local income tax deductions. We're limited now to $10,000. So are you, Grateful for that, and also, what is, I, I can't be doing anything. What do we do to hopefully fix this to get our full deduction back? I appreciate the, uh, the, the comment and question. So uh, first off, what was uh, passed originally, um, just, to, just to recap, when you said the SALT was in it, uh, the SALT deduction was in it as, as is. There was no change to the SALT deduction in what originally passed the House. There were two votes in the House as far as budget resolutions go. The first one that I voted for that didn't make any change whatsoever to the SALT deduction cap. Then the second vote, the one that actually became law, that budget resolution changed the SALT deduction cap and I voted against it. So it, it's, when you say I was for it before I was against it, you're talking about two different budget resolutions. The first budget resolution that I was for was a budget resolution that made no changes to the state and local tax deduction. The budget resolution that I voted against was the one that did make a change to the, salt, to the state and local tax 
deduction. And when that final bill, that was just a budget resolution, when the final bill came up that made a change to the, sol the state local tax deduction, I voted against that as well. Now, as far as the state local tax deduction goes, I believe that if a change was going to be made, a better change would have been one. If a change was going to get made, a better change would have been one that fully protected middle income itemizers indexed to inflation. So if you were to cap it at twenty to $25,000, for example, indexing into inflation, the only people who would be impacted would, would be folks who are wealthier. Um, but as far as, for example, um, most people who would live uh, you know, in, in our local community, uh, such as myself, my taxes on my house are maybe about $8,900 roughly uh, for my tax, about 71% of that is school taxes which is a whole other question and conversation for us uh, to have. We have a great school district. Um, but we're hearing that from all over Long Island. Um, 120, 30, 124 school districts right now. Um, all with their own directors of math, science, social studies, superintendents, deputy superintendents. They all have their own administrations. The state and local tax deduction was as high as it was for so many people because our state and local tax deduction, our state and local taxes are so high. Every level of government has a responsibility to play, play in reducing the amount of taxes that we owe. So the federal government has, you know, they uh, have income taxes that we all pay. To the federal government, we pay income taxes. To the state government, we pay income taxes. To the state government, we pay sales taxes. We pay a lot in property taxes, primarily to our school district, but we have a multiple other taxing jurisdictions that we all see when we get uh, our tax bill from Sweet Lou Marcosian. Who um, you always going to say Lou and only hear Lou? Um, but Lou's a great guy. He gets booed though because he's the tax guy. Uh, every level of government has a responsibility to play in order to uh, in, in order to provide tax relief. But if a change was going to be made, a better change would have been one that fully protected middle income itemizers. And there are multiple bills that I co-sponsor right now. To the question of what are you doing now, there are multiple bills that I co-sponsor. And this is a parochial issue for us as uh, New Yorkers. So one bill is a bill that was introduced by Nita Lowy. Another bill is a, a bill that was introduced uh, by Pete King and Tom Swazi. Uh, there are proposals out there. So Tom is now on the House Ways and Means Committee. So is Bill Piscrell, who is from New Jersey. Uh, I have a proposal with Josh Gottheimer that we've been trying to get support from people who don't care as much about the SALT issue as we do, and that's a challenge for everyone who's been putting forth different proposals at committee and in legislation. I would say, on the corporate side, uh, making our corporate tax rate more competitive to have a 21% uh, tax rate uh, versus a 35% tax rate, we're seeing, we've seen positive effects as it relates to uh, the business climate in the country. Um, but I don't believe that you should pay for reducing taxes on anyone on the corporate side by increasing taxes on everyone on the personal income side. So that was what, in my mind, my ideology, my philosophy as relates to the tax bill that was passed and signed into law. What I disliked the most about it was the change that was being made on the corporate side shouldn't result in a tax increase for anybody on the personal income side. And that's how they were to pay for the bill. By the way, also, whenever you want to talk about cutting taxes, you have to have a conversation about trying to find efficiencies in how we spend money. And unfortunately, it's just not fair game at all for that conversation whenever you talk about tax relief at the federal level, no matter what idea you have to provide any type of efficiency to save any money whatsoever, it's, it, it, for whatever reason, it's just not fair game to have that conversation. So step one, if you were to make any change on the corporate side, you should pay for it by, by leveling the playing field on the corporate side. Because you have some corporations that are not paying any money. Amazon's not paying any money in taxes. You have other companies that are small, smaller businesses, smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses, and they're paying taxes, and they have to compete with Amazon, and it's hard enough as it is uh, with all the ways that Amazon is able to cut costs through their business model. But if you're going to cut taxes on the corporate side, you should pay for it um, by ways to level the playing field on the corporate side not by raising taxes on anyone on the personal income side, and you should be pursuing the spending efficiencies as well. Can I just follow up real quick? Sure. Congressman Zeldin, 
I, I, I know there's bipartisan support to restore our salt production in the House. How do you, you're a Republican, Mr. McConnell's a Republican, how do you convince him to take up the bill and actually put it for a vote? Because I think if you put it for a vote, it would pass. So how do we get him to put it up for a vote? Is, it, is, that, is that a fair and a phrasing of it? I, you know, I, I, don't know the, I don't know the whip count on hand as far as the Senate goes. It just as far as whether or not you would get 60 votes to pass it, I, I can't stand before you and tell you that I think there are. But in order to have the vote, so that oh, the Senate right, process. Right, right. Yeah, so to, to go through the process, you'd have to get 60 votes to, and, and then you have another vote where you have to write 51 votes. The, uh, the House, uh, I would, so to your question, on the House side, I do think, as far as the whip count goes, which I don't have it, I would assume that you would have a majority to pass one of these bills on the House side. By the way, you also have to decide what bill you want to pass. So we're now going, in, we're now in September of 2019. We've been talking about this issue all, you know, all year long. The Ways and Means Committee needs to pick a bill, pick a proposal, and move it through the committee and through the floor. Because there's different, there's competing ideas of which bill to pass. But in the, in the meantime, we're not passing anything. As far as getting new support, I actually think that uh, you would need to get more support from the administration, the White House, from the president. Uh, you have people who are around the, the president who are um, who are strongly in favor of making that change to the state and local tax deduction. There are people around him uh, who supported that when it first got done. Um, but the president. Uh, when we're going through the tax law changes, what he wanted, the, the primary ask with that whole bill was that he wanted the change to the corporate tax rate. On the, uh, the change to the state and local tax deduction, there were some people who worked for the president and there were some people in the House who philosophically believe, and this is something that was debated, they believe that the SALT deduction is, uh, is their state subsidizing our state. And that debate is, the response is, that we send so much more, I mean, go state by state. You have a figure for New York of how much we get back for every dollar that we send to Washington. And we send a lot more to Washington than we get back in return. We are a net donor state. And their states are net recipient states. So don't tell me that you're subsidizing our state. But in talking about strategy, the, the votes are there on the House side. But if you wanted to get the votes to pass it on the Senate side, I actually don't think it would happen without the president weighing in, the executive branch, the administration weighing in in support of that House passed bill. In order to get the few extra votes, in order to have, whether it's 51 or 60 votes. So 
Yeah, I would say contact our local American Legion or post and uh, try to get that assistance. They try also try to move towards telemedicine. Some people don't want to, they live in Shirley, Mastiff, Mastiff Beach. They want to see their doctor in Northport without having to go to Northport. Uh, the doctors are now utilizing more of uh, the telehealth technology and there's new technology coming to help make that better. But the whole VA conversation we have a whole new interest on that, so I'll just come here. Okay, more is going to push me. say this as far as healthcare goes, and this, this also relates to a lot of other really important issues that are before uh, Congress, uh, always have been, always will be, certain issues that if any one party tries to go at it alone, you're going to end up with flaws that are going to have to get fixed or worse at some point as it gets implemented in the years uh, to follow. Uh, I remember there was a really big piece of legislation in the state senate when I was there that they had the votes to pass the bill, but they wanted to make the bill better. So they sat down and met with people who were going, who were voting no, and who were going to vote no anyway. But they had ideas on how to improve the bill, so they it, 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 the process worked, and they strengthened the bill and they made it better. Uh, I would strongly encourage whether you're going back in time to the passage of the ACA or you're in 2019 now talking about what should we do next. Each party and people within our party are going to come up with ideas. We actually, from conservatives, moderates, liberals, Republicans, Democrats, House, and Senate, there are a lot of individuals. There's 535 members. There are a lot of ideas on what to do with and ultimately, what should get done is a product of everybody working together, a process that works together, and then substantively a bill that comes from bipartisanship. And right now, when you have a Democratic House, a Republican Senate that, again, you know, the process requires 60 votes, and a Republican President, there is no way that you're going to see anything done to fix these all these issues with regards to health care if, if neither side is willing to talk to each other. Um, I, and no one has all of the answers. As far as um, how people get health insurance, I mean, this debate has primarily been about the individual one. Primarily. There's some conversation that takes place with regards to the employer market. The individual market is only about 6 or 7% of Americans. Yeah, and, and, and as, you know, as you look at the individual market from uh, one state to state and also one county to the next, you're at the point where 40% of the counties in America have only one option left under the exchange. So here locally, you, you lose an option, you then pursue another option that is available. Whether you like it or not is always another story, it's an individual choice. But imagine that for close to 40% of the counties in the country, you lose your one option, there is no other option uh, under the exchange. Um, ultimately, uh, a lot of what's in the, uh, the ACA, Obamacare, whatever we want to call it, um, the, a lot of what was in it was already law in New York. Coverage for individuals with pre-existing conditions has been around since the 90s in New York. The community health ratings, the coverage for essential health benefits, that gold standard of what a health insurance policy should look like has been law in New York since the 90s. The issue is that 40% of the counties in the country are down to one option left, and they're trying desperately to save their, their market. And the business model for an insurance company is actually, for these health insurance companies, is relatively simple to understand. They try to bring in more for premiums and deductibles than they have to pay out. And when they implemented the ACA, they had to raise premiums and deductibles but you get to, in order to pay out what they owed, because the minimum policy was raised, and eventually you get to the point where you price people out and they can't afford their policy, so they have no insurances at all. Some people who are considered having insurance policies right now can't afford their health insurance policy. They can't afford their deductible. So do they really have access to a policy at all? 
And this is philosophically where you get to the heart of the disagreement between conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, is on the is on the individual market. Should there be an individual mandate? Some people passionately say yes, others passionately say no. And I don't fault anyone for you know saying it's partisanship, partisan games. People generally have genuinely have their positions as it relates to, to the mandate. And when it gets to some of these essential health benefits and the community rating, how to do it, not as much impacts, it doesn't impact us as much here in New York, where we have other options and our cost is less than what we're experiencing in other states. But in some of those other states, they're desperate for those changes. And that conversation is complicated, but uh, you know, we would have to decide which of the essential health benefits covered under the Affordable Care Act, we are willing to make any changes to. What changes are we okay with making in community rating? There's a change to community rating in the bill that the House passed in the summer of 2017. But in New York, we have a law that says you can't charge someone more based on age. So what was interesting is that we actually ended up as a net benefit beneficiary from what would have had what passed the House as it relates to the age component because of laws that are enacted by the state. Um, now this is all about health insurance. There's also a lot that needs to get done. There's stuff that has been done as far as heroin opioid abuse. There's more that needs to get done. Um, there is, there's a lot more related to cancer research and investing in NIH and the research mission at Stony Brook and Brookhaven Lab and Cold Spring Harbor Lab, whether it's well-known diseases or rare diseases. So this, the, the, the whole, the question really, um, that in itself could be a whole other conversation or meeting because it's not just a conversation about the individual market, which is for good reason getting a ton of uh, debate in our country over the course of the last decade, uh, but what shouldn't get lost is the need to be finding cures, treatments, Lyme disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and the list, uh, that list goes on. Um, and by the way, a lot of that other stuff you can find and have found great bipartisan agreements. Bills passed, signed into law, and if you put on, or what channel you put on, there's a 0% chance that day that anyone will tell you. Uh, you can you can then have a funding uh, appropriation 
for doing this from the federal level. But as of right now, and this is the way it's been for a decade, uh, same issue. I don't, I wouldn't fault you know, my, my predecessor, one I owe for this as well. Uh, we haven't had earmarks in Congress since 2009. As far as funding from the state government, they, they do their planning uh, several years at a time. So they, they will come out with a basically a booklet of projects, which will be a five-year vision of what they want to do that in continuing to advocate to members of the State Assembly and the State Senate who represent our area, what, you're, what you need to do is, uh, what, they need to, what they would need to do is get it added to one of these five-year plans to have funding appropriate for the bridge. It's gonna be expensive. And it's also gonna be important that the local community backs them up on it. Because I also have heard different visions of how to relieve that traffic and where to have that bridge. And there's some people who don't want uh, that bridge in some of the places, some of the locations that have been suggested. Uh, so but as far as the federal government, unless they bring back their mark process or they create a new, for example, when we did the Safe Bridges Act with that five-year fully funded highway bill that I was talking about earlier, that fu is funding Smith Point Bridge, 57 million, it's funding the 26 million for Hospital Road Bridge. That was a product of changing the federal formula for state local bridges. That is to redo to revitalize, to widen, or replace a bridge that is considered structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. There are over 80 of those bridges in the first congressional district. It doesn't, that funding doesn't apply to creating a bridge where there is none now. So while there was a change made on the bridges, it doesn't, it wouldn't fund a, a new bridge. There's just a little bit of, of background. I haven't heard anything in, in years. You know, as far as uh, getting something like that added to a, a five-year, uh, the five-year year state capital plan. Okay, I think Kate, did you have a question? So I, mean, I, I, you, I would totally agree with you, uh, with your, with your sentiment uh, on it, with your opinion on it. Uh, these are U.S. service members. They are sent uh, overseas for deployments uh, or stationed in some other status abroad. And if you commit yourself to a life in the military on active duty, that active duty life might have you serving. You might be in Germany, then you might be in Italy, then you might be in Japan and you might meet someone who is your future, your future husband, your future wife, you have a kid, and part of taking care of your own, taking care of our own service members through that process, uh, we should be treating uh, their sons and daughters as U.S. citizens. So my question is, are the Mississippi State members? Um, So I've been having discussions with the, uh, the administration on this and, and other topics. Um, I, I believe, I'm hoping that there's gonna be a modification made to that particular policy. Um, we go, as I mentioned, we go back to DC on Monday. Uh, we, this was a decision that was just announced. We haven't been in DC since it was announced in the last week uh, or, or so. Uh, it caught all of us off guard. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of Republicans who, um, who feel the same way that I do, feel the same way that, that you do, that you just expressed. 
Uh, and I would anticipate a change being made to that particular policy. There are some other policy changes that have been made in the DOD uh, where I, I just I don't think that they're going to go a different way. Uh, there are other topics that could be discussed as far as Funding was done on an emergency basis to restore 
uh, our area just south of the, the peninsula. There's additional funding towards coastal resiliency, towards dune replenishment as part of that fire island to Montauk Point plan that I was updating in my uh, initial remarks. Uh, there's also funding uh, that is being used. There's 4,400 homes that will qualify for home raising at no out-of-pocket cost for that homeowner. If you look at the maps, that those maps are, you can say disproportionately, depending on how you, you want to categorize it, uh, disproportionately um, concentrated homes that are in our area. There are a lot of homes that are going to qualify for that home raising. There have been programs that, uh, as part of this process with local community input, some communities have chosen about to bring something up that's going to more is going to have like she's going to have nightmares as I say but as I say this the good old days remember the good old days when you're the mayor of Massachusetts yeah, yeah. Great. Um, so there uh, there there was an opportunity as part of the same um, appropriation that funded FIM some local communities opted to do buyouts uh, in their local areas some communities opted not to do buyouts. Uh, we, I, in my opinion, we have an overdeveloped coastline um, all around Long Island, not entirely. Some areas worse than others. Uh, where you're able to have land, especially if you're talking about, I mean, Forge River is overdeveloped. Um, the Carmen's River, there was legislation enacted several years ago. I was in the state legislature at the time to help preserve, um, help preserve. Carmen's River and make sure that, that wasn't further developed and there were development credits given for other areas further away from Carmen's River. Um, due to replenishment, the coastal resiliency, the buyout, um, preserving some of uh, this, this land. And the, other, the other part of it is this debate over the new inlet and old inlet. I was one of the people who had the position from the beginning that, uh, that this was a good thing, whether I was saying that with the fingers crossed because what you didn't want to have happen is to say it was a good thing, and then a year later, another storm hits, and it blows wide open, and it's so big that it's nearly impossible to close. And fortunately, the state has had it, the state of the inlet has had it shift, but it hasn't widened too much where it's become a problem with that. The consequence has been greatly improved water quality. Um, it's helped for marine and wildlife, it's helped flush the Carmens, it can't hurt as far as the Forge River. Some people have theories that the new inland and old inland has contributed towards um, towards rising uh, levels. I, I personally, I, I, don't, I have not seen that myself. I have, I've, I've met with a lot of people who have shown me a lot of maps and, and their opinion and their science and they don't, they don't think that's the, uh, the reason why. Um, but you know, there are people in other parts of our country who insist, and they don't represent New York one, they insist that everyone who lives near the water needs to move away from the water, and then they say problem solved. But that's not, I mean, this is our home. So we want to be able to stay here. And my job in representing the Massive Peninsula, my job living on the Massive Peninsula, is to make sure that that Fire Island to Monto Point plan, for example, gets over the finish line. It, it goes, in October, it's supposed to have, go to headquarters of the Army, and then within a few months, it's supposed to come to Congress for review. This is an idea that started in the 50s, and we're that close towards actually having uh, that project get done, but those are all sorts of different ideas. Like, one other thing that would be great is we have 20, 20 estuaries of national significance in the country. Two of them are part of the New York One. One is entirely New York One, iconic estuary. The other one is uh, Long Island Sound, which we share with uh, a neighboring state and a lot of other congressional districts and four, and four United States senators. I believe that our area down here would be great to have like a Great South Bay estuary created as an estuary of national significance. And what I've noticed in floating this idea is that people there are a lot of other estuaries wanting to be added, people who represent other estuaries wanting to add a 29th plus estuary to that program. 
and everyone around the country is meeting resistance on it because there's only so much money for the National Asteroid Program, and they're worried that by adding more asteroids, that's going to dilute the amount of money that's available for any individual asteroid. Uh, but I mean, just if, if you think outside the box, that would be that would be. I think one of the things we're dealing with now that we've been talking about is we have an antiquated um, drainage system throughout the town that runs everything into the, a lot of it goes into the marina, a lot comes out along the uh, coastline. A lot of those pipes are rotted. Uh, there's some that have been identified as collapsed. So uh, how do we deal with that? Yes, that's, uh, that, that's a bad uh, situation that needs to get resolved. I feel like you know, there are local representatives who are well aware, they're from the, the community as well, and that they would like to resolve it just as much as you do. I know that uh, you saw it exposed you know, locally, I think it was the Third Blue Claw Crab Festival. Yeah, um, the, I mean, this is something, I mean, you're talking about decades old infrastructure that is contributing to the, the drainage issue. It's, as you point out, it's a town asset. Uh, and I would, I would love to be able to work with the town at the end of the day whether you're at the you know you're at the federal level, you're at the local school board, you're in the state legislature, uh, you know it's a town-led initiative and it's a town asset. There is no just like earlier on when I was talking about uh, Sunrise Highway access that there that there aren't earmarks right now. If there was an earmark, it would be it would be easy to add a line to a bill in order to exchange for one of my votes, and I'd be able to help get money for. Um, you know, for re replacing the drainage here locally. Uh, but if there's if there is any way at all that the federal government can help, uh, I would love to be able to assist uh, with that one because it is beyond its expiration date and we're seeing the consequences of it. Thank you. And I'm gonna cut you short and I'm gonna call one more person. This lady in the front's been waiting, so So the uh, Foreign Service Corps uh, into answering that. Um, so, and knowing that's my last answer, I'm, I'm going to try to get to both anyway. So, as far as uh, as far as legislation goes, what uh, something that was passed um, that I supported was the Fix Nix bill. We saw that exposed after the Charleston shooting. Information not being shared uh, that could have that would have prevented, in my opinion, the uh, the Charleston shooter. <coughs> Uh, same thing for the Stop School Violence Act, which was passed and signed into law as well, which was something that was introduced post Parkland. Uh, the after Las Vegas, there was a change made by the executive branch as it relates to bump stocks, which effectively convert a semi-automatic rifle into a fully automatic rifle. It should be treated as an automatic weapon if you, you know, essentially are using an automatic weapon. It should be regulated uh, as such. Uh, I support uh, the Mass Violence Prevention Act. Uh, the the uh, whether it's law enforcement, the information that's going to to law enforcement, the firearms that are making its way onto the black market, what we just saw play out in Odessa, for example, um, was a product of an illegal manufacturer uh, selling firearms on the on the black market. Uh, that's problematic, and I, I believe that we can uh, I, I believe that we can pass legislation. I believe that we could pass the, um, the Mass Violence Prevention Act. Um, potentially we could make amendments to it, or we could take another bill and, and have a, a, a negotiation on it. Um, we'll see, I mean, the background check system itself right now has some serious flaws. Uh, Post Orlando, I introduced the Protect America Act. I believe that there are people who are known or suspected terrorists who should not have access, by the way, to any firearm. They shouldn't have access to a slingshot. I mean, there are people, Nicholas Cruz shouldn't have had a slingshot. Um, but post Orlando, you have someone who is already on the FBI's radar, already on the no-fly list, and because of the law that was in place, um, we don't even go back far enough to be able to capture him. And, and that was something that, I, I have a responsibility if I say that I'm against there was one proposal related to the no-fly list that I was opposed to, that I'm still opposed uh, to today. It's my responsibility to then say what you're for. And the key is, is uh, where the burden should be. 
if someone is a purchaser and the government is going to uh, stop that purchase because they believe that the person is a is going to carry out a terrorist act. I believe that the burden should be on the government to show that they have evidence to support their claim. The, the other legislation that was out there put the burden on the purchaser to prove that they're not a terrorist. I just had an issue with the burden. I believe there should be a hearing. You should have a right to counsel at a hearing. There should be notice of a hearing. There should be due process. Because whenever you're enacting laws, if you end up going after the, the rights of law-abiding citizens, you're not getting to the heart of that particular issue that you're trying to respond to or prevent happening again. Um, I believe that that's, that that's a bad idea, and that's why Post Orlando introduced the, uh, the Protect America Act. As far as the background check system goes, uh, there was one year, a few years ago, there were over 80,000 attempted illegal purchases of firearms that were stopped, the system working. But then the DOJ went and prosecuted just over 40 of those cases. Um, that was a product of the laws that are currently on the books working and then the resources not being sent uh, to deal with it. Now, as far as um, better informing the background check system, um, we have to have a, a conversation as a country of what type of changes we feel comfortable making to HIPAA. Because if you, you want to seek help and you have a certain amount of you have a lot of confidentiality and privileged communications between you and the person you're seeking help from, that professional. And that information can be sent to your employer, it can be sent to the background check system, you might not be able to obtain a firearm. Certain people aren't gonna be able to, people aren't gonna be as honest in getting help. Um, so we just have to have a conversation as Americans what we want on that, but we're not having that conversation yet, but that really gets to the heart of how to better inform amongst the medical professionals who have additional information but they're not sharing it because they can't. Also, social media, um, they, they have a responsibility too. Uh, some of these sites, people incite violence, incite deadly violence on their social media platform. Uh, they have a responsibility as far as monitoring accounts, monitoring traffic, communicating with law enforcement, and then all levels of government need to do a better job communicating with each other as well. Perfect example of Parkland. All the signs were there. The Nicholas Cruz wanted to shoot up a school. He shouldn't have had access to any type of uh, any type of firearm. Uh, so all of that's part of uh, the, the debate. And something happened, absolutely. I also think we need to do a better job talking to each other and not past each other. I'll tell you, it does nothing. If, if, there's, if there was a shooting and someone decided to announce, uh, you know, like they wanted to go on social media and blame blame me for that shooting, you, you got nowhere with it. But like, if you want to actually sit down and have a conversation about it, let's talk about it. I'll find out where you stand, I'll tell you where I stand and we can discuss. I had one meeting in my office that was one of the most interesting meetings that I've had as a member of Congress. Attorney Moms Demand Action and the, and the, the uh, SAFE, uh, Long Island SAFE which is a pro-gun group on Long Island. And it was a civil conversation where you had people who are gun owners, um, who are strongly pro-Second Amendment, and people who have a very different position than them, and they were sharing ideas, and I think there was a lot of educating going back and forth, and it was a healthy conversation, but we as a country, we're not doing that right now. We've gotten to the point where you know, like before you even have facts. If you, if you want, if something bad happens and we want to deal with that to make sure that doesn't happen again, what we've seen, and I mentioned, I mentioned legislation post Charleston, legislation post Orlando, legislation and executive action post Las Vegas, uh, executive action, uh, a legislation that passed post Parkland. That's the responsible way of doing things is when you just have a calm, reasonable conversation with each other Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, when something bad happens and you want to do something about it to make sure it doesn't happen again. And we have a lot of people with very different opinions on the issue and we have to respect each other's opinions. I'll tell you, it gets nowhere. If you protest in front of my office and you put a sign with my daughter's names on it with guns pointed at their name, you're not getting anywhere with it. So I, I just I think that we just need to do a better job communicating with each other and trying to find trying to find common ground. And I think there is uh, more common ground to be found. And if I could just briefly segue to try to find a way to bring up, so I serve on the, the Foreign Affairs Committee. 
Um, we have jurisdiction over the State Department. Uh, th there is a funding issue um, at the State Department. There are a lot of vacancies at the, at the State Department. There are a lot of career civil service. Um, people who are doing a great job, we're talking about deployments earlier as it relates to active duty military. We have a lot of people who are career State Department uh, in the diplomatic corps, and they have been deployed a lot longer than a lot of, you know, uh, the average person. We got to the point in the military where a very small fraction of our military is deployed to Iraq or Kuwait or Qatar or Afghanistan. Um, a lot of our military is, is actually located in their home stations for the most part. The stations for a lot of people in the diplomatic corps are all over the world. And a lot of them, when you look at their resumes, they serve in all sorts of really crazy places uh, and they make a career out of it. Um, I'm, I'm so, I've been, I, I have a good relationship with their representatives in Washington. Uh, we just passed the State Department Reauthorization Act. Um, we need to ensure that, you know, that they have the support that they need from a, a grateful country to be treating members of our diplomatic corps and understanding their deployments and the hardships uh, that they face spending so much time away from family in the way that they are, uh, that the way that they are compensated and taken care of and, and led. Um, I, I couldn't find a better way to segue between the two questions. But I know it was my last one, so I hope you don't mind. I wanted to. Okay, well, thank you, Congressman, for joining us. Thank you.